Right, a very warm welcome to our weekly Learning Your Lunchtime webinar. We've got uh, P. Pacific Caballero Uwazi with us. So looking forward to getting into just an absolutely inspiring and wonderful conversation um, with him just now. But a reminder, uh, this is the Student Success Coach community. We have our Facebook group. We have the YouTube channel where you are now. And uh, really the focus of this community is to, to help students from all different types of backgrounds uh, be successful in their studies, and then obviously to go on and be successful uh, in the workplace. So pretty much every Friday, 12 o'clock, we go live. We have some guests. I do some live coaching on different topics uh, and really all geared around this idea of inspiring people uh, to think big, to grow into their dreams, to maximize their potential, and uh, you know take advantage of, uh, of what they have available to them in the way of opportunities to create a better life for themselves uh, and their family. So looking forward to getting into all of those as it relates to this gentleman that you see in front of me here, who I've known for many, many years, and uh, who I'm going to ask to just introduce himself. And as he does so, uh, perhaps, P, you can just mention that, uh, you know, big congratulations to you for launching your book uh, recently and also becoming a new dad. So we were just yes. talking all just now about how that all happened together. But over to you, P, just to give us a little bit of introduction and a background to yourself and your new book and your new baby. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Such a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, this uh, month of March has been quite an amazing month, actually. I remember uh, writing a post and I was saying, <clears throat> March 20, 2002, I was transitioning from being a car guard in the streets of Durban to becoming a university student at U in the University of Natal. And it was not a smooth transition. Those of you who will read the book, you will actually uh, understand how challenging that was to, from being a car guard to going straight into university. And then, of course, not having any social social structures or anybody to help me outside of the campus. My world was on campus. Um, but this transition, March 2002, 20 years now, uh, March 2022, uh, it's an amazing transition, one of becoming a father and one of becoming a published author. I, for a long time, I, I, for a few weeks, I knew that it will happen in the same week because we knew when the, the baby will be born. We knew the publisher told me the date of the release of the book. Um, but what I didn't know was that actually the day my daughter was delivered was actually the same day that the author copies were delivered to me. So it's I have quite a lot of coincidences like that in the book that I talk about as well. So I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't have... Um, made that happen even if I wanted to, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> you can imagine. Um, so I'm a new father now. My uh, beautiful wife and, and, and daughter, they are, they are well. Uh, we are home now. Uh, the family has grown. And uh, um, it's, it's such a joy. I just can't stop staring at her. Uh, we named her Ineza, which means goodness, uh, in, in inherent goodness. And um, and now, uh, uh, Peter, I can uh, tell 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 everybody about how we met as I talk about myself. Uh, so from the University of Natal, which then became the University of KwaZulu Natal, um, I majored in physics. And then after that, I was awarded the Mandela Road Scholarship. So you will see some of the details of that in the book when you read it. And then I was enrolled into the APSA graduate program. Uh, just a, a very, very quick story is uh, um, first, when I got enrolled, they called me to say, unfortunately, APSA Africa is full and there is no one else who needs an international student, uh, uh, graduate from Africa. Unfortunately, sorry for giving you false hopes. And <clears throat> this was like in October and uh, November, October, November. December 16th, that was a weekend. It was a long weekend. That December 16th, 2001 was a long weekend. Uh, 
No, it's a, sorry, my, my apologies. It's 2007, December 16th, 2007. That's when I received a call that long weekend on a Saturday uh, from a certain Debbie. <laughs> so she says, hello, uh, I'm, I'm in my office and I have your profile in front of me and I love it. I said, hello, um, it's great to hear from you, but you told me not to wait. So she said, well, who, who told you not to wait? I, I said the name and she said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm her boss. <laughs> so I still like your profile. And as we chatted, and, and I'm, I'm saying this because a lot of uh, the audience we have here as students, as we chatted, I realized that she was more impressed by my leadership activities and what I had been involved in as a student. And mm. of course, uh, which in large part is, is one of the reasons, I think the major reasons why the Mandela Roads uh, scholarship was um, given to me. So it's important to have your academic um, achievements, but I can tell you with certainty that what weighed more as I was being enrolled into the bank was more mm. my leadership qualities that they could see evidence of in mm. my profile and in the, all the interviews that I did. And so mm. uh, then Debbie said, explain to me what being a refugee means. Do you need a work permit? <laughs> I said, no, I don't. A refugee status gives me the right to work. And she said, well, are you still interested? <laughs> so I said, sure, I am. And so she organized an interview for me, which happened actually on the roof of the Pavilion Shopping Center, those of you who know Durban, because uh, I was living in Durban. And, uh, mm. and so the senior leader from APSA who met me for an interview, we met um, in Durban at the Pavilion. And then uh, when I went home, uh, my mother was visiting at the time. It was the first time she had come to visit me. I found her praying. And I found her on her knees praying. And she had been fasting. And so Gosh. I told her, Mom, I got, I got it. I will become an APSA graduate in the Amazing. graduate program. She's like, oh, what does that mean, graduate? Are you going to study? <laughs> So I said, no, it is actually literally being employed, but yeah. uh, starting first in the yeah. graduate program. Yeah. And so then I took off. And, um, you know, spoiler alert, uh, APSA uh, then booked a flight for me to go back to Johannesburg, where I was supposed to be because of the program, which happened to be quite... Um, a challenge for me because my mother was still in Durban and it just so happened that she was supposed to leave Durban that day to go back to Kigali. So I will only stop there so that I don't spoil everything. <laughs> no, that's fun. fantastic, and Pete. So, Thank yeah. you so much. Um, and I, I, I think, as you said, you know, the message to students, and we've got, you know, thousands of them in the student success coach community, really yes. is obviously to get the academics right, but then to do as much as they possibly can on top of that to make themselves as attractive as possible uh, to prospective employers and obviously to give back to the country. Um, you know, those of us that have been given opportunities, important like I do with this community, to give back as much as we possibly can. And that's what stood out uh, and really was, was, was the reason that you then, I think, had a lot of success from there. Absolutely. Sometimes when I look back at my, uh, my, my days as a student, I actually was surprised how um, I, I, I wasn't, uh, I, I did not say I'm going to do this because I have to give back to South Africa. I have to do this. It's just in my nature. right? Mm -hmm. But I realized that I actually did it. Uh, from being a car to being a, a university student, and then I created the, the physics society, what they call this physics society in, in, in the faculty there. And then I ended up in student politics as the president of the Science Students Council, uh, uh, representing students, uh, science students at the university. And even then, in this is my early days in my, ad, ad, uh, uh, I would say, adult activities. Uh, I was quite determined that I was going to be involved. So I wasn't going to say, stand on the sidelines and have no representation of students or have poor representation of students. If it was going to happen, I was going to be part of it. And so 
it didn't matter that I was a foreigner, that I, in fact, I was a refugee. I was on refugee status. It didn't matter. And yeah. I then had to work with Sasco. Those of you who are students, you know, Sasco, the, the AMC. Uh, mm. And then there is the Sadesmo is the other one. And so I had to work with them. I had to take student mandates, uh, you know, and then take them to mm. these faculty meetings. But I was representing all uh, students, South African students, international students, and refugee students alike, everybody. Um, mm. But wh what I want to say by this is, when you open yourself to it, mm. you get opportunities. It does happen. And it do actually doesn't matter what would seem as a disadvantage, your status, your nationality, mm. or whatever it is that you think would be an impediment. If you are open to it, it mm. will come to you as well. And then when the opportunity arises, stand up and take it. Yeah, fantastic. P, let's uh, look at a couple of questions and comments that we've got in the chat, which are just uh, absolutely wonderful to see. So, uh, Nomzamo says, hi, P, lovely to see you doing so well. Um, might have met you when you were still a car guard. Uh, she always knew you were going to go far. Congratulations. You'd be so proud. I don't know if you recognize any of the names. Yes. Okay, yes, so, I do. So, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's the, like, the last name I would have expected to pop up is Makulu. She was oh. so just a very quick story. Makulu was introduced to me by the uh, Professor Rejoice Ngongo, who was her best friend, and she was the scholarships manager at the at the, at the Mandela Roads uh, uh, the Mandela Roads uh, Foundation. And so one day she called me, she said, what are you doing for Christmas, uh, uh, P? Of course, I'm a refugee. So I said, no, I'm on campus. So every, every, every holiday, I would have to apply for exemption to stay on campus because I didn't have anywhere to go. Um, and so she said, no, not this time. Come with me. We're going mm. to have uh, lunch somewhere. And so she oh. took me to Makulu. And the first time she saw me, she said, ah, Bandla. That's a, a favorite word uh, that she used to. Oh, Bahantla, it, it's it's really you. And so I said, Makulu, what do you mean? She said, I saw you in my dream. Do you have a grandmother? I said, No, I don't. She said, Yes, you do. I am your grandmother. Uh -oh. <laughs> so that's how I first Makulu, I first met Makulu, and that's she incredible. taught me a lot. She taught me how to trust myself. She taught me about. You know, she, she used to call them guides. She said, your guides are very strong. Your guides are very strong. Listen mm. to them. You know, so mm. uh, really, oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, wonderful. Uh, for that. Wonderful. But P, let's it's just tell a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to have someone join us uh, from your past. That's fantastic. Yes. Um, yes. P, let's just talk a little bit, uh, you know, so obviously as a refugee from Rwanda, you arrived in this country, you did have some money, but you lost the money and you ended up, you know, as I think people realize now, as a car guard. But the connection with the university, and I remember when I interviewed you on the podcast, was yes. that you would see the students walking onto campus every day and swiping their student card through the turnstiles, if I remember correctly. So yeah. just make the connection and, and fill in a little bit of the detail then from being a car guard and, and this person that met you at that time and as you sort of relayed in some detail in your book and then yeah. as you said, jumping ahead to majoring in physics. But how did you go? And I, I'll ask you, the reason I ask you this is to inspire people. Um, mm -hmm. How did you go from literally being a car guard, watching students going in and out, clocking their student card, to majoring in physics, becoming a Nelson Mandela Road Scholar. What, what was that tipping point for you, and what is your message to everybody um, as a result of your story? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> thanks, Peter. My, uh, I, I came to South Africa. Uh, I had been to the University of Rwanda for a few months. So uh, my hope was that wherever I will end up, I will be in uh, in the system as a refugee and i assumed that there will be surely some assistance to uh, you know for refugees to study or to survive that's that was my hope so <clears throat> uh, my first attempt of course was to go to canada it didn't work because people stole my money in tanzania and then uh, i decided to go to madagascar because it was the nearest french speaking country I didn't believe I was going to survive in a non-French speaking country because I'm educated in French. Um, 
and it didn't work. I went all the way through Mozambique, uh, and then eventually uh, all the circumstances just converged for me to end up in Durban. And in Durban, I met the Rwandan community. They said, this is how we survive. So I became a car guard. And uh, how about papers where well, you go to home affairs? And the first paper I got from home affairs was handwritten. And it was not a, so it was just this shock after shock after shock. And then eventually I had to do like everybody does. Mind you, there were uh, nurses and engineers and former politicians and former military officers and, and uh, teachers and all of them, people who were somebody at some point, they were all car guards. And so that actually humbled me because I was only a university student, but I still thought I'm going to go to university. The problem with being a car guard, of course, is that it's a territorial business. You have to be there. If you're not there, somebody will come and take it. So I realized early on that if I have my own place as a car guard, I'm going to be stuck. So my strategy was become the floating car guard, which means that I will become the car guard who looks after other people's places when they need to go somewhere, to home affairs or whatever. And so I was rotating through the different car guard spots. Uh, so the beach and uh, Victoria Embankment, those of the, those people would know. And um, uh, in the city center, I was a night watchman at some point. And then I became a car guard sometimes at the university. I watched uh, uh, a place in a place that was right near the university at the gate. So it was student cars. And so they would come in and out and in and out. And the turnstile gate was not far from me. So I would hear it click and clack. Um, and I would just sit in that parking lot thinking, one day I will push that gate and I will swipe that card. I looked forward to that. Hmm. And so... The greatest gift, some students gave me money, but the greatest gift that I would get from them was conversation. So some of them actually had conversation with me. Uh, they would tell me what they are studying and how they got there and what is in there. So they made me dream of the space mm. beyond the gate because uh, mm. I only saw them outside. And so eventually when I got my refugee status in November 2002, the first thing I, I, I you know, no, sorry, 2001, I, I, my, my, um, I'm sorry. The first thing I did was to go to the university and, uh, and say, hello, this is me. I'm a refugee. This is my academic papers. Here's my refugee status. I'm entitled to study and I want a place to study. Mm -hmm. And um, the faculty gave me a place to study with financial aid, but then the student funding center had a different opinion because they had never assisted a foreigner before. And so they said, no, that the faculty made a mistake. And that was the beginning of a long, long battle. But what mm. happened was that the Dean of Student Services, Trevor Wills, bless him, because I was determined to go through the um, hierarchy of the university to find somebody who will speak to me. The director of the Student Funding Center wouldn't have it. The Dean of Student Services actually said, uh, by the time I go to his office, he knew my name. <laughs> so he said, I think you have a point. <laughs> but, so that was the first time when I thought, Whew, there is hope. Yeah. He said, I think you have a point. We have a, a policy for refugees, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, for students, uh, uh, international students. We have a policy for uh, citizens. Uh, which includes permanent residents, but we say nothing in our policies about refugees. And I hmm. think that's a miss. Right? Wow. And so he said, but I can't do anything now. I need to table it before the council, uh, you know, come back. And But this come back, lectures have already started, right? So now I have to be a car guard and then attend lectures so that I don't fall too far behind. And of course, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And so mm. eventually I went to him and I said, I'm sorry, by the time we get it, I will have dropped out. He said, so what can I do for you? He mm. said, uh, uh, I need to be in race because rent is the biggest problem I have. Okay. And, and so I said, we didn't even get your financial aid package. You want a place in race, right? <laughs> but, uh, but then, <laughs> but then he, he picked up the phone and he called the student housing um after um, 
having a brief conversation with them, he said, okay, I've asked them to assist you. But wow. uh, even him, he, I think he was, he was quite uh, surprised by my audacity, if I mm. <laughs> can. But I really had no choice. You know, yeah. if, if I didn't move, then I would go and yeah. pay rent and food, you know, and, and yeah. forget lectures. And that's yeah. how, how I got it. And then I got a temporary registration card because my uh, financial aid package had not been finalized because at the time I still didn't have one. Mm. And the day I got my temporary registration card, Peter, it's not mm. that I had access to, to the LAN and to the, to the university. It that I was touching that gate so I can mm. push it myself. I mean, <laughs> I, I know so that... It, it, it sounds you had that weird. visualization, yeah. That visualization, and I swiped it and I heard the gate. Wow. Ah, I'm not emotional, even, even seeing it. Yeah. I swiped yeah. it, I heard the gate, I turned it, it turned, I said, it works. <laughs> it works. Yeah, and I think, P, you know, I mean, you know, Barack Obama's book was called The Audacity of Hope, right? And I mean, I yes. think, you know, we have to be audacious and we have to ask questions. What's the worst thing if somebody says no, right? Um, exactly. You know, and I think we have this you know, perception that we, sh we, we should stick where we are or live with the, what we've got. But actually, you know, we must ask questions. We must push the boundaries. We must challenge the status quo. We must, we must ask for things and we'll be surprised. Um, avenues will open up. And uh, as Alcinda says there on her message, um, your perseverance and tenacity is admirable, P. And I think that's one of the reasons that I was so thrilled to have you on this um, webinar today. Obviously, to congratulate you on your book and your baby and the wonderful journey that I've been privileged to be part of, but also to provide that message to our community that just keep going. You never know when that next question, that next visualization, that next assignment, that next writing project, you know, could just push you to the next level. And it's that step-by-step -step approach and never giving up that, you know, really gets you uh, uh, through the difficult times and gets you to the places that you want to get to uh, in your life. But P, Actually, let's... Uh, no. Well, yeah, go ahead. While you're speaking about that, I just because uh, there's a story related to that in which you you feature. Okay. <laughs> I, I remember being an APSA graduate at APSA uh, uh, on the 19th floor, and uh, and I was uh, I was working, and I had this this uh, piece of analysis to do, and I had a lot of graphs and a lot of things, and I think you walked past. My, my 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 desk a few times and you saw you saw that and then at some point a request came from London from Barclays if at that, mm. that time about uh, some of the work I was doing but nobody knew that it could be done uh, within within the organization and in that way at the time but I also didn't know how important it was so when I replied to all and sent this uh, piece of analysis, uh, you were one of the people who got it, Peter, and and then you negotiated that I actually be moved to a different function that has a lot more to do with mm. that kind of analysis. Uh, mm. And and from there, I I I got from being a, just an NAPSA graduate to becoming actually central to the creation of another team, which was the yep. the business performance management of that entire unit. So. I remember that. You remember that. <laughs> so you <laughs> never know when an opportunity is going to come. Just do your best and do it mm. to you to the best of your ability. A request came from London. I didn't know that it was coming. When I replied, I didn't know what the uh, mm. repercussions were going to be, but it actually yeah. ended up being great, you know. So and thank you for that. <laughs> my my pleasure, P. And as yeah. as you beautifully quote me on the back of your book, um, I walked beside you for some of the journey and I saw the impossible get done, which is obviously a reference to Mandela's great quote, um, that it is always impossible until it's done, right? And I think that's something yes. that comes through so strongly for me uh, in your life story and such a privilege to have walked beside you and recognize that, you know, many of us who haven't had the, 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 the difficulties in the background that you've had, for example, we often take that for granted and to mm -hmm. have come from where you did. And I want to talk about you know, being a refugee out of a war-torn country like Rwanda um, and the difficulties that you encountered to then achieving as much as you have um, is just so inspiring to myself as well. And to have played a very small role in that has been a privilege and an honor. And the more that you can tell your story, 
And the more that people can pick up your book uh, and share your message of hope, I think the more we can help people, you know, raise their status and take action to, uh, to solve the problems in their life and to improve their status, uh, whether it's through studies or to improve their career, or as you said, send an email with some analysis and somebody will see it and be impressed and help you move and be promoted, etc. You know, those are all the serendipitous moments of our lives um, that really count and make a difference. Absolutely. But Pete, I mean, when we met and when we interacted at EBSA and I learned, you know, so much from you as well, you know, mm. you even back then had this idea of writing your life story. And I remember that mm. you were always, you know, keeping notes and a journal and, uh, uh, and you had this dream even then to say you'd love to tell your story. And I think we chatted about it a couple of times. And then mm. to now seeing it in print, and as I showed it at the beginning and as I see it on the back of your bookshelf there, Tell us yes. about the process, um, and I presume, thank you very much, this is probably one of your limited author copies that you received, and as a fellow author, I know when you sign with a publisher, part of that contract is that they'll give you a very limited number of author copies that you can use uh, as part of a promotion, so I yes. really do appreciate that I'm, I'm one of those privileged people to get an author copy, and thank you very much for that, but just tell us a bit about the process of, of writing the book and and how long it took you to pull it together and working with the publisher and then finally seeing it on the shelves at the entrance of exclusive books, which, as I said to you when, just before we came online, I never saw my book on the front uh, stand of exclusive books because I wrote about woodworking, which pretty much goes in the back corner next to gardening. Um, mm -hmm. So a real privilege to have walked that journey as an author. Tell us a bit more about that, Pete. Yeah, <clears throat> so... Uh, the prologue of the book actually is it starts with how the seed was planted. Um, as a Mandela Road scholar, I was at a, a lunch with Nelson Mandela and Grassa Michelle. And <laughs> Grassa Michelle uh, literally spoke to Sean Johnson, who was the, the CEO of the Mandela Road Foundation, but a very, very prolific author as well, a good writer. Uh, uh, so <laughs> Grassa said, Sean, promise me that this story will be in a book. So Sean said, yes, it will be in a book. Uh, so that, 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 that the promise was made. <laughs> so, but uh, then Sean had, um, uh, we started, we started working together and then he had uh, priorities and, and health uh, priorities as well, health related priorities as well as work. And so he handed the whole project over to me. Uh, and then at some point, and then I shelved it because I thought, it's too big. It's mm -hmm. it's too much, uh, especially because what I was writing about is the story of growing up in a in a, in a country Rwanda uh, that uh, most of you would have heard uh, the terrible uh, events that happened in the nineties. I was a teenager then throughout the whole period of that time, and so. Uh, uh, it was it was painful because a lot of the memories are memories I had decided I was going to bury, mm. and so I did not. Uh, especially also, the, the, this is a, this is a this is a key piece. I actually thought that my story is repulsive, that it is not a story worth sharing with the world, uh, mm. not only because of the gruesome nature of some of the things I had to say, but mm. also because I thought. I'm one of many, um, and also uh, people need to, they, they need something else, not me. Other people will do it. Other people will do it, right? And so <clears throat> eventually I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. And then I never really found a moment to do it because I was, uh, I was working, I was uh, all of this. Eventually, when I left APSA, I went to an organization. This is another really beautiful story of the CEO of that organization, uh, Jules. She uh, made me the top salesperson in that organization. I was an account executive, but it's, it's really it's another kind of way to say a salesperson. She made me the top salesperson. And at the height of my... Uh, journey with that organization, I had made so much commission that I could stay at home without work for eight months. Hmm. And so when I when I 
went to speak to her, I said, I, I really think I should take a break because number one, I'm exhausted. So I, I had to run myself nonstop from, yeah, from as long as I could remember. I really needed the break without worrying where the next piece of bread is going to come from. It was an amazing opportunity. But what she did, Peter, this is something, you know, the book is called Witnessing. And what I really would like people to witness is people like Jules as well. Mm. She said, you are my best account executive now. And, but I also would like to let you go because I understand what you are talking about. So she gave me the blessing to go. The following day, she published an article uh, saying, do you want talent? Let them go. <laughs> so, which, which is amazing. And then I thought I would start writing the Monday after. It didn't work like that. It took me four months to write my first words. And then I thought, how do I structure it? I don't know about writing. I don't know about, I'm not an author. I'm not a, but the key word here, the one thing I've learned about it is putting the time. This mm. is uh, how successful you are going to be is, is, mm. is, is really a function of effort. Mm. You might not know. You might not have an idea. I didn't have a publisher. I didn't know. I didn't have mm. an editor. I, didn't, I, I just had time on my hands. Mm. Put in the time. I just wrote with the ability that I had. Remember also, English is not my first mm. language. <laughs> so, but I just kept writing, 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 writing. And eventually, I gave it to an editor who then said, uh, if you really are writing this for you to heal and for you to share about healing, I think you should rewrite it again. Mm. At that time, I was upset with her. Mm. But then she actually had a point. The first mm. version of the book is written in first person in the present. I'm really talking about I am here. It's like a journal. Yeah. Um, I'm doing this. I'm seeing this. And then when I went to rewrite it, I could, I was so relieved. Mm. I had the details. But then I could tell about it as a story in the past. And mm. so that's when I started putting it in the past. And then I wrote a second version of the book. And then I decided, okay, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get a publisher. I'm going to self-publish. Right. So I went down the self-publishing route. And I even paid it. They, 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 you pay for a package and they edit for you and do a cover and do all of these things. But you are, self, you are doing it yourself. You promote it yourself. Mm. Halfway through the process, uh, something uh, inside told me this book is bigger than a self-published book. Mm. And, and so I thought, okay, I'm going to stop. I wrote to them and I said, look, I am aborting this process. Um, please, uh, if you can refund me, however much money you think you, is, is due to me, it's fine, but thank you for the journey so far. So mm. I shelved it again. Mm. And then eventually, when I was ready uh I spoke to a few friends. I said, do you know of publishers? They said, send me uh, just a little excerpt. And mm. so I did that. And surprise, surprise, this is when life is ready and when you are ready. Two publishers said, yes, we will publish this story. And the journey just continued smoothly with one of them. And hmm. uh, so at the time when I gave it to them, it was 130,000 words, uh, all about Rwanda. The, that book ended when I leave Rwanda. Then they come back with a curveball. Hmm. They said a book can only be between 80,000 and 90,000 words if uh, that's that, the digestible kind of length of a book. So you need to cut it down hmm. from 130,000. And we think it's very important that you tell your story in South Africa. You can't just talk yep. about it. And so not only did I have to cut it down significantly, I had to add another, um, another entire part. Oh, yeah. So what that meant was that uh, it wasn't just about removing things because, you know, as I removed things, they did, other things didn't make sense. And so, so then I literally started again. So that yep. I can, you know. so 
I, I, I wrote this book <laughs> like uh, three times. But yeah. the, the thing about it is, uh, and then of course, they, they, I, I was uh, given the most amazing author whose process was, I mean, I mean, the uh, editor was, uh, was also healing. Uh, really, the publisher and the editor understood the story and the sensitivity of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they, we had to talk about the, 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 the title. And the reason why I chose witnessing is that, and now I'm at the point where I believe witnessing is a deliberate act. It's not just enough to be there. Uh, you, you are there, but you can also actively post the event, witness what happened. And that's what I'm doing is, uh, uh, <clears throat> hello, Peter. Yes, go ahead, P. We are still online. Eh? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I, I am still witnessing what happened. And the more I witness it, the more I understand myself, the more I understand what, what life was trying to communicate. But more importantly, I am inviting everyone else who will read the book to witness with me. Mm. And so the book is uh, literally the perspective of that teenager as they grow up and witness mm. all of these things. And so it's not prescriptive. I don't, I don't, in the book, I don't say, this is what I learned from, from life and all of this. And no, no, it's not, I don't do that deliberately. I just, mm. I invite you to witness. And mm. so you can uh, make those lessons for yourselves. Right? Mm. You mm. can say, okay, now that I know this, I've witnessed this. What does that mean in my life? What does that mean in my world? Mm. Mm. And so... Uh, I have to say it was a lot easier from the moment when I got uh, a, a publisher because then we had deadlines and support because they, mm. they literally, there's somebody yeah. who's there to support you. Um, and the support came in the form of, okay, so we, we, we defined milestones and we said, okay, mm. how are you doing we, You know, in this week and that week and that mm. week? So we, we had kind of a contract on how in agreement between the two of us on how we are going to progress through it. And yeah. I would sometimes tell her, this, this part is too difficult for me. I can't really put a time to it because it, I, I want to go through it naturally. And then at some point she would uh, say, okay, and, and, and she would push back and say, remember why you are doing this. And it was yeah. not either or, it was just the balance between those two things. Right. right. Remaining purposeful, but also honoring the process that yep. I was going through. Again, I'm going to come back to the same word I said before. It's effort. Put yep. in the time. That's what yep. really made this work. Yeah. P, wonderful lessons there. And I think everybody, you know, can relate to that sort of scale of project that they might have had to do in their lives. And, you know, for students, it could be a large assignment, a big writing project, a, a PhD yes. Uh, which also involves a lot of writing. And as you say, just that daily discipline and putting the time and effort in and having the right people along the way to guide you and support you. And uh, like you say, you know, rewriting it a couple of times, I think anybody who's done a PhD or any postgraduate level research can yes. relate very well to, you know, supervisors, red pen through their writing. And that's your work that's now been thrown out, but also recognizing that there are people that have that different perspective and understand that they can add value and point you in a different direction and your writing and the outcome of it is going to have a bigger benefit um, if you think differently and position things in a different way. Um, so when I picked it up and went through it, you know, I really appreciated having been, I think, a part of some of those stop-start conversations. Yes. Um, commercially speaking, you know, the fact that you can get it onto the shelves, the publishers and the editors, they know what sells books, right? They know what people want to read and the style yeah. and the structure and the length of a book that will work on the bookshelves. As much as your yeah. own first-person journaling is interesting and useful to you, you can't just copy-paste that into a book and expect it to do well. So I think the message there, particularly for postgraduate students, is to you know, build a relationship with your supervisor, get somebody to mentor you and support you, Put the time and effort in if it's going to require a lot of writing and discipline and focus to get yes. through it. And like yes. you've now got your book out there, people can get a PhD, they can get their master's, they can complete these large-scale 
um, projects. Now, P, just the last couple of questions. I mean, and you talked about the title of the book, Witnessing, and you talked about how as readers, you know, we can witness your journey. But mm. and and maybe, you know, this is some of the, the sort of more difficult aspects of the book in your early, early years. I mean, you yourself witnessed some horrific things in Rwanda. And, and I think what I've respected about you over the years and something that I've tried to achieve in my own uh, leadership style is a degree of vulnerability and willingness to talk openly about difficult things that we've experienced and how we respond to that emotional mm. trauma and how it forms and shapes us and, and, and develops our character, etc. But, mm. but let me just read from the back cover and then, then you can maybe pick up the story um, and I'd also like you to touch on um, one of the incidents where, and a little bit difficult, I understand, but um, obviously with the atrocity, you know, you saw some terrible things happen and that affected your relationship, particularly with, with women, you know, over the years and with, with people in general. Uh, so well, let me just read then from the back uh, cover and you write in the first person that you were suddenly alone and terrified. And through the open gate, looking into our yard, I could just make out the soldier pointing his gun at my mother, mm. preparing to shoot. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, Peter, actually, I think many people who are watching now, they know that we are in Rwanda and around the world commemorating the genocide. And it so turns out this year that the days of the week actually coincide. So what was April 6th, Wednesday, was Wednesday, 1994. And so Thursday, uh, April 7th, that's when this happened at night. That would have been last night. So last night I was actually reflecting on that um, 28 years ago. Um, <clears throat> now... Uh, uh, one of the uh, things I say is, yes, of course, we bring ourselves in the world with intentionality, and sometimes we are completely at the mercy of what happens in the world as well. And so on that night, soldiers came at home, and they literally were looking for my mother so they can take her and us uh, because we were cockroaches. Now, it's a long story that, uh, I, of course, uh, I would like to zone in because of the time. But that moment... Um, we had a policeman who lived in our yard, in our uh, backyard uh, cottage, um, and he uh, was there, just arrived at the same time as the soldiers were uh, taking me and my mother uh, to, we didn't know, we just know surely that we were going to be killed. And, uh, and so he said, uh, where are you going, ma'am, at this hour? You know we are at war. She said, they are taking me. They are saying I'm a cockroach. And so, because it was a little bit dark, it was in the evening, he couldn't see the soldier. And so when he eventually saw the soldier, then they had this altercation. He was with two other policemen, and they, but the soldier was with many more. And so very shortly after, they started fighting and shooting. And so I stood there terrified and my mother fell on, on the ground on, in front of our house in the backyard. And I was outside of the gate, but I could see what's happening. I could see the, the people's uh, moving. And I literally saw this soldier, took his gun, pointed at my mother and the policeman jumped on his back at the same time as the gunshot went off. And so that was the last thing I saw because a neighbor then came from behind me, uh, held me and pulled me very violently to run with me into his home. But the last thing I saw was that soldier literally discharging the gun uh, uh, towards my mother as she was uh, beneath him and the, so the, the policeman jumping on his back. So that night, uh, well, it's a long story because then as soon as I got in the house, I ran back to come and see what happened. And then the men came back to get me 
And when he got me for the second time, he actually beat me up. He said, you are going to get yourself killed and us killed. And so he locked me in his house. And shortly after, the gunshot stopped and then the grenade exploded in our house. But I was in the neighbor's house. So I know the sound of the grenade and all the fragments uh, you know, falling on the roof. And so I knew that my mother had been killed and um, I knew that that uh, grenade had also uh, possibly injured other people at home or killed them. But I couldn't go out because the neighbor had locked the house. In the morning, my, my, my brother came running and said, we can't find mom, we can't find so-and-so. So he mentioned everybody at home, but then said, uh, the policeman is dead and his best friend also is dead. So <clears throat> when I walked home, the first thing from the same position, I saw my mother being shot. I looked in the backyard, I expecting to see her body. She wasn't there. Uh, but what I could see was the house. One of the rooms was completely destroyed. It was corrugated iron, a grenade, so it really destroyed it. And so as I walked into the yard and walked towards the house, I saw the body of the policeman and the body of his best friend. Um, and then shortly after, my mother appeared. She was not dead. She was wounded. The bullet missed her, uh, but burnt the skin next to the eye. Uh, so her, her face was swollen and she was bleeding, but she appeared. And she was very silent. So she stood in the corridor of our house, which, of course, disturbingly has had a lot of light because the roof of the, one of the mm. rooms was destroyed. And so mm. there was a lot of light coming through. And she looked through that door and looked up in the sky. This is, this is an image I will never, never forget. And then she took a cloth she had and wiped some of the blood that was coming down. Uh, and that, that night, I, I can, a lot of other things happened that night. I can talk about it for a long time. But that was the first night of um, seeing the, 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 the violent nature of what was happening. But that was only the beginning of three months of that uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the things that I saw, people were not as lucky as my mother. Uh, I saw people being shot, um, mm. uh, and being hacked to death. Uh, in some cases, actually, people I, I was familiar with in the neighborhood, uh, mm. literally killing people I was familiar with in the neighborhood. I was 13. I, I, of course, the only thing I understood was that they were killing them because they were either Tutsi or they were same pathetic to Tutsis, or they were uh, what what uh, they called traitors, uh, like my family. Mm -hmm. And so that was, um, of course, actually what even made the writing of this book a little difficult and took so much time, because at some point, I did not have words to mm -hmm. express what I've mm -hmm. seen. Eventually, I actually uh, thanks to people who listened to me. And uh, this is one of the, the hopes I have for humanity is because I have encountered it over and over and over again. People who just listen to you because you are human, not because mm -hmm. they expect anything from you, not because they are going to have some intervention in your life, not because they, uh, just because they are there to listen without any judgment. And I've had so many of these opportunities and that is how, Peter, I am mm. able to talk about what I've seen during mm. that time. And that is how I am able to say, uh, I'm inviting you to witness with me. Mm. That is because there are so many people who literally witnessed me as I grappled with these things. In the book, I talk about one of the uh, incidents where I literally had to be held as I was screaming at the the, one of the scenes that I have witnessed during that time. And so um, uh, we are not alone. This is mm. really the situation. Earlier we were talking about just do it. There will be people to help you, but we are not alone. But mm. that part also is, is 
one of the things that I'm feeling called to do is now to make sure people understand they are not alone when they are with me. And mm. so it's important that you actually give people a non-judgmental ear. Don't put yourself under pressure to solve their problems. That's mm. probably not what is needed. What mm. is needed is just listen yeah. without judging them. They, as they are, in their story matters. If mm. you get them to understand that you know that and you act mm. accordingly, that is the greatest gift you can give to them. Wow. Yeah. Gosh, Pete, thank you. I um, Having heard that story before a number of times, I think people who have heard it for the first time now, I think, uh, you know, will be quite inspired and touched and uh, probably want to read a lot more. And again, I thank you for, you know, your vulnerability and willingness to speak openly about what you experienced and how it affected you and how you've responded to it and how over many years eventually you have now had the courage to put it all into print. Uh, so, P, I'm reminded again just of the role that we all have uh, in this world um, to restore humanity uh, where it's been taken away from us and with small acts of kindness and listening and acceptance and eliminating judgment, um, there is a surprising amount of good that all of us can do uh, every day uh, with everybody that is already in our lives without having to go out and change the world and, and solve big human conflicts like Rwanda or like we're seeing in Ukraine today, which still 25 years on from Rwanda, unbelievable that you know we're still not learning the lessons of history um, we're deemed to repeat them. Uh, there is good that we can still do uh, in spite of what we witness as potentially a failure of leadership around the world. Uh, there are people in our lives today uh, you know, with whom we can still do a lot of good. And I'm privileged to have maybe played a little bit of that role with you, along with other people that you mentioned in the book um, mm -hmm. throughout your life. So P, uh, Cindy, and many others, I think, uh, you know, watching today have been humbled and inspired and have commented on that and I'm grateful that they've joined us today and that you've given us your time to inspire us and to talk about your book. Now mm. as we just wrap up P, um, great question there from Alcinda. Um, so where can uh, we purchase a copy of the book? Yeah, um, actually it's, it's at exclusive books and uh, a few other bookstores across the country and you can also order it online from Take A Lot uh, and um, Uppercase and Raru and Lutz. And for those who do ebooks, it is also as an ebook on major platforms, including uh, Amazon. Um, and so it's, it's the publisher, I think they, they really honored the, 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 I want to say they honored the story and the act of witnessing in that way. So they uh, put it out and wide. Mm. Ah, I can mention as well that there is uh, a book launch at Exclusive Books, Rosbach, on Wednesday, mm. 6.30. Uh, so RSVP at events at exclusivebooks.co.za. Yeah. Uh, so is that an email address? Events? Events at, at exclusivebooks.co.za. Now, I'm, yeah, I'm seeing sorry, the, Sorry, just P, I just want to type that in here. Is that Wednesday next week? What's the date? The date? Wednesday, 13th of yeah. April, uh, 6 for 6.30. Uh, RSVP, okay. obviously, really important. Uh, events at exclusivebooks.co.ca. Yeah. And which, which exclusive books is it? Rosebank. Rosebank. Okay. Yes. I'm just going to put that in here. Um, okay, so I'm just going to pop that in the chat there. So hopefully people can come along and buy a copy and get you to sign it, which um, yes. will be very exciting. Um, yes. So that's great. And Alcinda says she's definitely going to grab a copy. Um, Alcinda is one of our, our newest members into the group, and I had a lovely chat with Alcinda. So fantastic to have Alcinda with us yes. today. And many others. Nick, um, who's contributed um, – to a number of uh, our students in the community and Cindy yes. um, and Les and Tracy and many others in this sort of wonderful community that we built 
around this idea of uh, of, of student success. So, P, you've contributed yeah. to that. Uh, a fantastic today. May I, may I make may I make a, a, a request because there is a comment that popped up from Rejoice mm. Tongo. Yes, uh, there we go. Uh, yeah. yeah, and Rejoice is Professor Tongo, uh, the former scholarships manager of the Mandera Roads Scholarship. Okay, okay. They very Rejoice <laughs> to introduced me to Makulu that uh, the earlier. Um, Contributor spoke to, I, and I think it's a, one of the one of Makulu's grandchildren actually, uh, who who, uh, who who contributed earlier. So, rejoice! I see you, and thank you for seeing me, uh, <laughs> just seeing me as a human being. Uh, and I I can tell you, Peter, there is a story that involves rejoice in the book. Um, one of those profound moments where I was sharing with her something, and her response was, uh, P, we love you. Hmm. And it was completely, the la- it was the last thing I would have expected to hear, given hmm. the context of that conversation. And so, wow. uh, rejoice, I love you too. <laughs> yeah. P, I think that's such a special um, to end on um, mm. and uh, really appreciate the serendipity uh, of a number of the people joining and commenting on their relationship with you uh, yes. in your journey because that's made it very special and people that you've recognized by their comments and by their names I think has really given us an opportunity for them to reflect on their relationship with you and to be reminded um, you know, of the role that they played um, in your life. So, um, P, I see we've got a couple of people promising to pick up a copy. So, as a fellow author, uh, we really would love, you know, your support uh, for P. Uh, do please get a copy um, and get it signed if you can pop into uh, exclusive books at Rosebank um, on the 13th of April at 6 o'clock. Um, I'm sure, P, that's going to be a blessed event and i know you've had a couple of other book launches and i wish you continued success uh uh, with the book but just like a baby um Mm. that you now are not able to stop looking at uh, a book once it's out there equally is something that you sort of continue to ponder and Mm. whatever is the next phase or the next steps of your journey um both as a father uh to your newborn baby and as a, a father of another type of baby a book that you can now put on your bookshelf and be extremely proud of um, P, we here at the uh, Student Success Coach, um, like Nick Smith says there, feel we were blessed today by your presence. Thank you for your time and your support and your energy, and we wish you everything of the best. So, P, any last thoughts from yourself? Uh, Peter, thank you. Um, I have to say that if if I have been able to write uh, that book, it's because of opportunities like this. And so you continue to really make such a difference in, in, in my life by giving me an opportunity to share. Uh, and uh, the last thing I would like to say is, um, I mean, I know we, we, we mentioned the word effort, effort, effort. Uh, I, 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 the reason why I keep saying it is because you can be brilliant. You can be uh, uh, extremely um, passionate. But if you don't sit down and actually put in those hours, it's going to be difficult. And really, that is what the, the, the about you know with students, whether whatever the project you are doing, even if you still don't see where it is going, mm. sit down and put in the effort because in that pile of work you are putting together uh, over time, you are going to reach and pull the jewel that you want to. Um, present to everyone else. So effort, effort, effort. And lastly, just witness. Witness others and witness yourself because witnessing is actually intentional. It's not just being there. It's intentional. 
P, thank you. We've been able to witness your journey by talking with you for the past hour. We really appreciate it. And uh, you've spoken very true words, which are often repeated um, on these webinars and in all the work that I do in the Student Success Coach community, which is to take action, put in the time and effort, and the success and the results and the benefits will come over time. Um, but you do need coaches and mentors and people to support you on that journey. And my thanks to those people that have played a role in your life and to those type of people who play a role in the community of our students. Um, mm -hmm. A huge thank you for all the good that you do. So P, wishing you well for the book launch next week, um, ongoing fatherhood and ongoing reflections uh, on this wonderful uh, milestone of getting your book onto the shelf. So with that, we're going to say uh, goodbye to everybody. Have a truly wonderful weekend ahead. And thank you, P, for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, Nomzamo. Thank you, Rejoice. Thank you, Peter, and everybody who was on this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.